A Chinese expert says Beijing copied its way to the world's front row, and now it uses that leverage to get away with aggression toward the West. Hong Kong's special status is still long gone, in keeping with former President Trump's policy. The city is now considered no different than mainland China, a shift that holds severe consequences for the financial hub. Hong Kong's democracy has all but faded, this after Beijing cuts down on opposition from the city's electoral system. A historic moment for Taiwan. For the first time in 42 years, a U.S. ambassador visits the island. And China says it would welcome a visit from the United Nations to its Xinjiang region, but adds that it will not allow investigation into reported abuse of the Uyghur ethnic minority. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In a viral speech, a Chinese professor reveals the communist regime's shortcut to economic success. And a big part of that is using Western firms to the CCP's advantage. NTD's Juliet Song has the details. One Chinese professor's remarks are getting attention online. In a speech, he bragged about what the Chinese regime did to outpace the Western economy. Looking back, we did only one thing for the past four decades. That is copying. We copied our way to the world's front row. We plagiarized barbarically. We copied wildly. What intellectual property? What patented technology? We'll get it first and deal with it later. Zen is a visiting professor to one of China's top universities. He's also a prominent marketing expert. He said the regime's efforts to steal innovation came to a halt when the U.S. started taking note of the theft. But by then, China had become one of the world's biggest economies. He added that now there's nothing left to copy. Zen's speech might have painted an extreme picture in some ways, as China hasn't become the leader in all industries. But it did touch on an important point. That is, to join the ranks of the world's leading economies, the Chinese regime employed an unusual tactic, exchanging market access for technology. In 1970s, the regime opened up the Chinese market during economic reforms, and it relied on foreign investments and know-how to boost its economy. We let foreigners in with their technology, cars, money, experience and wisdom. But for Western companies, gaining access to the Chinese market comes with a condition. Chinese authorities require them to enter partnerships with domestic firms and hand over their core technology. That way, locals can eventually learn to recreate it themselves. Now 40 years have passed in the blink of an eye. We learn to do it ourselves. Looking back, the plant is ours, the equipment is ours. The technology, patents, products, market and branding have all become ours. The foreigners are all gone. Zen's speech outlined the regime's strategy in simple terms, to rob, replicate and replace. After successfully replicating Western know-how, the regime's goal is to eventually replace them in the global market. One example is China's high-speed rail development. In 2005, Beijing turned to Western firms for high-speed rail technology. But before bidding for contracts, Western firms had to sign contracts transferring their technology to Chinese firms. But the steep conditions didn't stop companies that wanted a bite of China's massive market and manufacturing industry giants like Siemens and Alstom all joined in. Eventually, the regime acquired their key technology. And much to the company's surprise, the regime started applying for high-speed rail patents abroad within just a few years. The move turned former partners into fierce competitors. And because Chinese firms are backed by state subsidies, they have a competitive edge over their Western counterparts. An honorary chairman of one of Japan's main railway companies once said, the Japanese bullet train is the jewel of Japan. The technology transfer to China was a huge mistake. The U.S. has tried to put a stop to the situation. The Trump administration launched a trade war in 2018, partly to force the regime stop leveraging market access in exchange for technology. It remains to be seen how the Biden administration will tackle the issue. Juliet Song, NTD News. We hear from experts on how the new Biden administration can address national security threats. Those threats stem from Communist China's digital espionage. NTD's Kevin Hogan brings us more on the FCC commissioner's take on Huawei as it relates to China's Belt and Road Initiative. There's 
nothing that a, that a communist likes less uh, than hearing the truth spoken freely. The commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, Brendan Carr, says the U.S. needs to continue the State Department's successful effort to promote clean networks across the world. He says the U.S. needs to keep engaging with other countries to counter the Chinese regime's efforts to promote Huawei through its Belt and Road Initiative. In Africa, myself, I've been, um, you know, a couple uh, hour drive down a bumpy road outside of any uh, major town. You get these small little communities and there's, you know, Huawei banners all over the place. Um, and so they're playing a very long game um, with respect to this Belt and Road Initiative in, in Huawei. ZTE. Dean Chung is a senior research fellow at the conservative-leaning Heritage Foundation. He said Chinese Internet providers, hardware manufacturers, and software designers can all be made to comply with Chinese law. He says in the Chinese system, there's no civil society and nothing is beyond the CCP's reach. So whether it's a private company or a state-owned enterprise, the CCP still has access to them. And they may even have Communist Party committees that oversee every aspect of operations, he says. This, combined with the Chinese term ABC for artificial intelligence, big data, and cloud computing, allows the CCP to manage a huge amount of data in order to maintain surveillance over its population, Chung says. And this includes the typical uh, espionage aspect of trying to find out other people's military secrets. Uh, your war plans, your fighter aircraft designs, uh, your transportation plans. But in addition to that is monitoring what the Chinese would consider anti-China elements. He says these anti-China elements may be the Tibetan government, organizations that advocate religious freedom, or just simply groups that oppose the CCP. He notes that, to China, these are all targets that the CCP must penetrate. Nuri Turkel is the commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He's a Uyghur himself. He brought up the fact that the CCP-sanctioned chairwoman Gail Manchin and vice chair Tony Perkins over the weekend in retaliation for U.S. sanctions on entities involved in genocide against Uyghurs in Xinjiang. This is a sign of desperation uh, in Chinese attempt uh, to try to change the narrative, try to turn this into whataboutism, trying to call the United States the states or objective uh, professionals uh, who have training and knowledge on this as liars. So when you have nothing to say, when you are cornered, uh, this is what they do, what, what you do. What aboutism traces back to Cold War propaganda, where the Soviet Union, instead of addressing concerns about uncomfortable questions about what it's doing, would point at unfavorable events in the U.S. and other parts of the Western world to deflect responsibility. Turkel says when the Chinese regime calls people standing up to its abuse as liars, it's a global concern, and he says now this is a bipartisan issue. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. Chinese telecom giant Huawei is releasing its annual report for 2020. It indicates a moderate profit growth, but a decline in its smartphone business. The company is now striving for survival with other alternatives. Chinese telecom giant Huawei reported a modest annual growth for 2020. Huawei's rotating chairman, Ken Hu, released the information on Wednesday. He says the company's net profit last year came in at about $10 billion. The growth rate was 3.2 percent, and that's a drop from 5.6 the year before. Huawei's overseas revenue declined due to the pandemic and U.S. sanctions. There have been different degrees of decline in overseas sales. The pandemic also has an impact on the supply chain. These are all expected, but overall it's going down. Then U.S. President Trump put Huawei on an export blacklist in 2019. The move barred the company from accessing critical U.S. technology. The ban put Huawei's handset business under immense pressure. But the chairman did not specify how much the company's smartphone revenue declined. The telecom giant is now striving to find a breakthrough in less glamorous alternatives, such as farming and mining. The company is now turning to new customers, among them fish farms and coal mines. Huawei equips them with inverters and Wi-Fi sensors. A BBC report from last month says Huawei is also developing AI technology for pig farmers. Huawei's founder and CEO said last month that they will keep looking for new opportunities to survive. Now we turn to updates on Hong Kong. The U.S. State Department is reaffirming that Hong Kong is no longer autonomous, and so it won't give the city special treatment like trade perks. 
The U.S. used to treat the city differently from China when it comes to trade. For example, when the U.S. slapped tariffs on China, Hong Kong was not affected. But the special treatment comes with a condition. That is, the Chinese regime must give the city the freedom it promised. When the communist regime took over the former British colony in 1997, it promised to give Hong Kong 50 years of autonomy. So unlike the rest of China, Hong Kong enjoyed freedom of speech and some democracy. But the regime tightened its grip on the city in recent years. In 2019, President Trump evoked the city's special trade status for the first time. A new law also allows the U.S. to impose sanctions on officials responsible for undermining Hong Kong's democracy. It requires the State Department to review the city situation every year and confirm to Congress whether it has democracy and whether the U.S. should continue to give it special trade conditions. In a statement, Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the Chinese regime continues to erode the city's autonomy, and he has certified to Congress that the city doesn't warrant special treatment under U.S. law. Hopes for democracy in Hong Kong disappear as Beijing moves ahead with electoral reform. Communist Party loyalists could potentially make up 80 percent of Hong Kong's main lawmaking body. NTD's Don Ma has more on that. Pro-democracy activist Nathan Law says freedom is dead in Hong Kong. His comment follows sweeping new changes to Hong Kong's electoral system imposed by Beijing. The changes give the Chinese Communist Party overarching control over nearly every aspect of Hong Kong's government. It did this by driving pro-Beijing lawmakers, deemed so-called patriots, into the city's legislative council. Under the new system, potentially 80% of the council seats could be appointed by the Chinese regime, while only 20% are elected by the people. What's more, that 20% will still have to be vetted for loyalty to Beijing. The move has significant implications. That's because Hong Kong's Legislative Council has jurisdiction over the city's chief executive. It also appoints judges to Hong Kong's top courts and decides what laws are passed in the city. Nathan Law says the changes mean there will be no opposition voice in the council hereafter. Another prominent democracy activist says communist China has successfully taken over Hong Kong. In this political system, in the electoral system, they may have won, they may have dominated, but they will never win the people's respect. As per Chinese state media, the changes were unanimously endorsed by China's National People's Congress and signed by Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping. The National People's Congress is China's top legislature. It's also widely accused of being a rubber stamp body, serving under Xi Jinping. Don Ma, NTD News. A historic moment for Taiwan. For the first time in 42 years, a U.S. ambassador visited Taiwan. U.S. Ambassador to the Pacific Island nation of Palau, John Hennessy Nyland, arrived in Taipei with Palau's president last Sunday. This is the first time a U.S. ambassador visited Taiwan since 1979. That was when President Jimmy Carter cut diplomatic ties with Taipei in favor of Beijing. Palau is one of the 15 countries that still has official diplomatic ties with Taiwan and not with Beijing. In 2018, then-President Trump approved the Taiwan Travel Act. It allows for high-level U.S. officials to visit Taipei. An international relations professor at a Taipei university says the visit may signal that the U.S. would assist Taiwan and Palau against pressure from Beijing. The Chinese regime condemned the visit the following day. Its foreign ministry spokesman warned that any contact between the U.S. and Taiwan will damage U.S.-China relations. On Monday, Beijing sent 10 warplanes to Taiwan's air zone in an apparent act of aggression. The Chinese regime claims Taiwan as its own territory. Taiwan has its own constitution, military and currency. Beijing does not allow foreign countries to establish diplomatic relations with both Taipei and Beijing. On Monday, the Chinese regime's foreign ministry says it welcomes UN's visit to China's Xinjiang region. But there is one condition, that the UN does not conduct investigations there. The Chinese foreign ministry says the purpose of the visit is to promote exchanges and cooperation between the two sides, not to conduct a so-called investigation with a presumption of guilt. This comes after the United Nations held serious negotiations with Beijing on getting unrestricted access to Xinjiang. UN Secretary General says the visit will center around investigating reported abuses of Uyghur Muslims there.
UN experts estimate that around 1 million Uyghurs have been detained in camps in Xinjiang. A UN report last month cited abuses such as arbitrary detention, ill treatment, sexual violence and forced labor. Critics have been skeptical that the visit will be meaningful. They doubt the UN will have unfettered access in China. Fourteen countries and the World Health Organization chief are questioning new findings about the Chinese Communist Party or CCP virus. Just hours after the WHO released its report on the pandemic's origins. The Tuesday report claims the popular lab leak theory is extremely unlikely and said no further effort should be spent investigating it. The leak theory suggests the pandemic started after viruses accidentally leaked from a Wuhan lab. Hot on the heels of the WHO's findings, the U.S. and 13 countries signed a joint statement sharply criticizing it. It reads, the international expert study on the source of the SARS-CoV-2 virus was significantly delayed and lacked access to complete original data and samples. During a briefing about the report, the WHO chief admitted that he doesn't believe that this assessment was extensive enough and added that more investigation should be done on the lab leak theory. The safety of Chinese-made vaccines is once again in the spotlight. New reports say an 80-year-old Hong Kong resident died two days after receiving a CCP virus vaccine dose made by Chinese biotech company Sinovac. It's the third day in a row deaths have been reported in Hong Kong, all tied to the vaccine. Twelve in total have died so far. Other patients are reporting severe side effects after getting the Sinovac shot. That's including facial paralysis. Hong Kong suspended the use of the Pfizer vaccine in late March over defective packaging. For now, Hong Kong residents only have access to Chinese-made Sinovac vaccines. Despite reports circulating of potentially fatal side effects, one vulnerable group is still being forced to get the shot. Pregnant women have not been spared from China's forced vaccination mandate. The regime claims getting the shot is voluntary and not required by law. But a number of local authorities seem to treat vaccinating the public as a necessary political task. Officials have already ordered that all staff from state-run institutions and schools must get vaccinated. And they make no exception for pregnant women, even though vaccination warnings urge them to steer clear of the shots. Now people are telling their stories online. Some describe women who have been forced to put plans to start families on hold in order to first get the vaccine. If they refuse, they'll lose their jobs. In China, many women working in state-owned institutions need permission from their workplace before getting pregnant. Reports also claim women who are still breastfeeding their children still must get the shot, too. A vaccine disclaimer is making the rounds. It asserts that a Chinese-made CCP virus vaccine isn't tested on humans. The news was posted on Twitter Wednesday. In China, people need to consent to a disclaimer before getting a vaccine shot. But this one says it's still possible to get infected after inoculation. A Chinese internet user responded to the details online, saying the Chinese regime has 10,000 ways to force you to get vaccinated. Ordinary people can't resist it at all, unless you are not in China. In France, a report says at least 25 percent of public debt is owned by Chinese investors, a figure that might cause concern for strategic interests in the future. NTD's David Vives has the story. After castles, vineyards and airports, Chinese investors seem to have found something else to purchase in France. Public debt. According to a report published by an economic think tank, China owns at least 25 percent of France's public debt. For economist Philippe Erlin, this is in line with the CCP strategy to conquer Europe. We know for sure that China is buying what it can in European countries. They bought machinery companies in Germany, wines in France. It is like a market. They take what is best in each country. In September 2020, the French Minister of Economy and Finance said China's central bank was among the first to own France's debt. It says the pandemic which triggered a 300% hike of France's public debt, could increase the scale of this issue. It also says the more debt China owns, the easier it will be for the CCP to influence France's politics and attitude toward China. The Minister of the Economy said in a report published this month on public debt, we have seen countries become dependent on their creditors. And there's also another problem, according to Erlen. 
Forced closures of many businesses and enterprises have resulted in many of those going bankrupt, and they too are being purchased by China. Some Chinese companies seem to have benefited from the economic crisis. In the U.S., we saw big tech companies benefit from the closures of small businesses. This is the same for China, which also increased its presence in Western countries. They are now able to purchase at very low cost any assets in France or in other countries, which they do. NTD reached out to the think tank about who exactly owns the public debt. The director said she asked the same question to the Ministry of Economy. But hasn't received an answer. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. The BBC's China correspondent is now in Taiwan. John Sudworth left China after he faced threats and pressure from the Chinese regime. The UK based broadcaster BBC said on Wednesday its Beijing correspondent had relocated to Taiwan amid pressure from the Chinese regime. John Sudworth was known for his reporting on the treatment of the Uyghur people. He said he had been under surveillance, faced threats of legal action, obstruction and intimidation. China's foreign ministry on Wednesday said it had never threatened him, but it strongly condemned the BBC's reporting on Xinjiang, coronavirus pandemic and Hong Kong. Sudworth said on his way to the airport, plainclothes police officers followed him and his family all the way into the check-in area. The BBC says Sudworth, who was based in China for nine years, will remain its China correspondent. The Chinese regime may want to control the next generation of global currency. That's by pushing its digital currency system. Once that's achieved, U.S. sanctions won't work on the regime anymore. And the digital system will allow the regime absolute control over people's economic activities. China's central bank recently set up a joint venture with SWIFT. That's an interbank messaging system. Thousands of banks across the globe rely on it to communicate with each other. Half of the world's high-value cross-border payments run through it. And its members own the system. Chinese yuan accounts for about only 2 percent of SWIFT's international transactions, while the U.S. dollar takes up about 40 percent. A former vice president of the Bank of China and a former SWIFT board member recently told the South China Morning Post that the joint venture is meant to promote the Chinese yuan into a more international currency and to promote China's digital currency development. This new digital currency is similar to China's existing online payment systems Alipay and WeChat Pay. People use their phones to pay for things. The regime has been expanding piloting programs in several cities. Other digital currencies, such as Bitcoin, focus on decentralizing the control over money. But the CCP's digital currency system allows the regime to monitor every single transaction, such as who paid how much for what at what time. In a previous interview with NTD Business, a U.S. congressman explained... China's using their monetary system as a system of control And they're proposing to link their central bank digital currency to their social credit system where they know virtually everything about everyone. They could filter all the transactions and essentially say, uh, yeah, we're not going to bank those people. Uh, But if you do these things, we can bank you and essentially filter all the transactions now. And it may not be just the Chinese people. The regime may also push foreign businesses operating in China to use the digital currency. Seeing the trend in digital currency, Beijing may also aim to use it to cut reliance or even replace the U.S. dollar system. As tensions between the two countries escalate in recent years, the Chinese regime became increasingly concerned about potential sanctions by the U.S. They have the potential to cut China off from the dollar-dominated SWIFT system. Currently, about 76 percent of Chinese banks' overseas assets are denominated in U.S. dollars. The U.S. has previously used the method to sanction Russian and Iranian entities. That's why some Chinese officials are calling for Beijing to cut reliance on the U.S. dollar and develop its own international payment system. Some expect the Chinese regime will use the 2022 Beijing Olympics to show off the system and promote its digital currency to the world. Experts believe the Chinese regime will internationalize its currency by starting with the developing countries first. The regime has more influence over African countries and countries that take part in the CCP's Belt and Road Initiative. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.